working with the Solutional Research Group there at the University of Kutu Yuman Tal, I've met a lot of other people here. Um, I currently work for ACOM, who are an engineering consultancy. The format for today, I think we're going to have each presentation followed by one week of action and two questions, and then if we have time at the end, we'll open it up to a panel discussion. And can I ask you as well, just during the presentation, do you think of any sort of takeaway points from the session? That would be great if you can think about them, keep it in your head, and we'll come back to them at the end, and that will go into the conference summary. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, it's Alison Parker from Cranfield University. She's a lecturer in international water and sanitation there. And Cranfield University is a founding member of WhatsApp and they conduct research together on climate change impacts, groundwater monitoring, sanitation, and lots of other things. <coughs> she is going to speak about treating container toilet waste in Kumasi in Ghana. Um, so, thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to talk about, as we've said, is a project that we're doing in collaboration with uh, WhatsApp uh, and with uh, Clean Team. Uh, in Ghana. Now, uh, to, to start off, I think I need to tell you a little bit about Clean Team. Maybe some of you are familiar already, um, and it's already been talked about in a few sessions. Uh, but Clean Team uh, is a container toilet business. Uh, so the principle is that every uh, customer has a toilet that's um, small, a portable toilet that can fit in their in their home. Uh, this lady has one actually in her bedroom, um, but. Lots of people have them in their, in their bathrooms, um, so it provides an alternative to the public toilets which most people in Kumasi, in Ghana, where clean team uh, are based, use. So the toilet is a container toilet. Um, so what you can see in this photo is the container, the white or the black container that sits inside the toilet, um, and the uh, container is delivered uh, full of, or partly full of a blue uh, liquid. Uh, which acts as uh, a deodorant and a biocide to keep uh, the smell and the sight of the human waste away from the users. It's a urine diverting toilet as well. So uh, three or four times a week, um, the uh, service uh, agent will come to the house to remove containers of the waste and replace it with a clean, fresh, uh, container ready for use again. Um, and the containers are taken to a central site where they're emptied. Uh, currently in uh, Kumasi, because there's a big uh, sewage treatment site there which has some uh, waste stabilisation ponds, the uh, container toilets can be emptied into these ponds. And the uh, municipality are very happy with that arrangement. Um, but this isn't uh, sustainable um, in the long term, probably. It's certainly not sustainable if a uh, clean team were to move to a different city where they didn't have that arrangement um, with the, the city sewage treatment works. So, um, we'll sort of ask Cranfield to look into uh, a way of treating the waste the clean team were producing. Uh, so, we decided we were going to try on three options. Um, so the aim of the project was to identify three off-the-shelf options. So these aren't kind of research, um, these aren't currently being researched, these aren't under development. These are things that you can buy off the shelf and we're going to we're trialing them with the uh, clean team uh, waste. So the criteria we developed when we were selecting the technologies are listed here. Um, so it had, to, uh, it had to be able to treat uh, the effluent uh, for discharge, uh, into the environment um, as specified by the Ghanaian guidelines which are actually extremely stringent, much stricter than we would have in the UK for example. Um, so that's, uh, that's quite a challenge. The treatment uh, unit should have a small footprint so that it can fit on the site that Clean Team already <coughs> operates uh, in Ghana but also any future sites. Um, the treatment should have a low capital cost. It should be easy to transport and install, particularly easy to transport if the site is going to have to be moved for whatever reason. Um, the, the technology should have a, a track record of extended operation in operating situations. Um, the treatment unit should be able to oper be operated by uh, well-trained competent staff, but not staff that have a, a degree, just uh, well-trained staff, but not very highly qualified. 
Um, and the unit should have a low energy use. So, wow, that's quite a, a demanding list. Um, and when we started scoping around, we realized that fulfilling this list exactly was going to be impossible. But uh, we had to try and find some technologies that were going to make this as closely as possible. And that's what we've done. So the first uh, technology we're trying is called Systema Biobolsa. And this has, uh, you see, three uh, tube flow anaerobic digesters. And then they uh, flow into three uh, aerobic uh, gravel filters. Uh, this system was developed in Mexico for use with animal waste. And they've just started trying it in Mexico with uh, human waste when we approach them. And they've been very keen to work with us on this completely novel waste to see how it works. Um, so this is a photo of the system installed at Kumasi. Uh, you can see the three uh, digester bags uh, there. And you can see right at the front of the photo um, are the holes where the planted uh, gravel filters will be installed. Uh, the second technology is uh, BioRock. Um, and this is um, a system that was developed uh, in Luxembourg for treating uh, waterborne sewage. Um, but we were um, attracted to it because it does stand alone and it doesn't use any external energy because it uses, um, it uses natural draft to provide the ventilation uh, that the aerobic stage needs. So um, the first stage is an anaerobic uh, tank which provides initial, uh, initial settling, uh, and then it goes into the second tank, which contains uh, a synthetic media, which is treated with enzymes, uh, which um, will break down the waste uh, aerobically. And uh, we've imported these from Luxembourg, and these is a photo of them being uh, installed at Akumasi. We've decided to go for two of the aerobic uh, um, tanks, which are the ones on the right, because we're really worried about overloading the system. It's only ever been used on waterborne sewage before, and we're going to try something that's incredibly uh, much more concentrated than that. Uh, but the uh, first tank where the solids are settled will require disludging. Um, so the last technology we're going to try is a bio, uh, biofill system. Um, and uh, the solids will be entered into biofill. Those of you that might be familiar with uh, biofill, uh, it was developed as a household uh, sanitation system in Ghana, and it's, uh, it relies on macro fauna to break down uh, solids. So uh, this will try as another novel application to use with clean tea waste. Um, so these technologies are in the process of being installed uh, in Ghana. Uh, on the site uh, where clean team are working. Um, and this is our plan for uh, when we get the technologies commissioned, what we will, what we will do. So, Systema Biobolsa will start with 1,000 litres of the waste a day, scale up to, sorry, 100 litres, scaling up to 1,000 litres. Um, the BioRock system will start with just 50 litres a day and scale up. Um, until we get um, either a two-day retention time or we're really worried that the system's going to fail because it's not kind of optimised for the kind of waste that we're, we're treating. And the biofill system will receive the sludge out of the biorock system. Um, we'll collect samples daily and test for pH, alkalinity, ammonia, COD, temperature, um, stability, and the presence of the dye in the final uh, effluent. So the blue dye that you saw in the weight in the blue liquid at the beginning, we'll see if that persists through the system. Uh, we'll also uh, test, do weekly tests for total solids, volatile solids and E. coli, and daily tests, uh, and keep a diary on uh, how easy the plants are to operate. Um, and we'll also do phytotoxicity trials every six weeks to check if the chemical biocide uh, still persists. So I'm afraid I don't have any more results to present to you today. This is Still, the trial is still at quite early stage. It's taken us a long time to get to this stage of having the technologies installed. Um, having said that, this gives me a great opportunity with so many brilliant minds in the room to get any feedback which you can actually use at this stage to improve the project going forward. So please do give me uh, any feedback, any questions. Um, please are my contact details. And also, if you're interested in uh, finding out more about Clean Team, um, I know uh, Andy now comes with
presenting at the workshop on Thursday, um, and you can also check out Team Team's uh, website uh, just there. Great, super thanks very much. Thank you very much. My name is Philemon from Botswana. Um, um, thank you very much for those uh, technologies that are very interesting. But for your second uh, technology, the, I don't know whether it's the bio lock. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can see that it is, you know, a, a deep underground. <coughs> Uh, I can see that it's deep underground, and I'm wondering, in cases of um, high groundwater table, what we have, you know, problems of, you know, flotation? Yes, basically, I think that, that could be a problem. The site we have at Don Quasi, we don't have a problem with uh, groundwater there, so it will work well there. Um, so, yeah, I think that's... Uh, definitely, a, definitely a problem we have to consider when, when uh, Clean Team move to different cities, if they're selecting new cities, uh, new locations for doing this waste treatment, if this is the one that we go for, and in fact the system of our is buried to a certain extent as well, so we would have to sort of suggest that they found a site that didn't have a high groundwater, or you know, we have to work on other solutions to stop the flotation. Any other questions? Hi, Jess McCarthy here from ID. I'm just curious, we're doing a similar project, or not kind of similar, in urban Dhaka in Bangladesh, and we had a really hard time getting assistance into Dhaka. So I'm just wondering if there was any, any learnings from the actual procurement of these technologies and getting them to the locations, and if you can just give any like, examples of how that was difficult or easy. Um, so yeah, it, it's difficult, for sure. Um, so we were lucky because, um, uh, clean team is supported both by WUSF and Unilever, and Unilever already have quite a lot of experience in importing uh, things into Ghana. Um, so we, we use the route that they, would, they used, and, but I guess the first tip is um, you know, try and find people who've done it before, into, specifically into Bangladesh, and you use the way you know, take their learnings. Our second tip, which seemed to work, was air freighting stuff rather than land freighting stuff, because apparently uh, our airport is quite a small holding bay, so the customer people are keen to get it shifted out, whereas the dock apparently is a huge holding bay, so things get stuck in the dock for ages, but obviously the uh, air freight costs are quite a lot more than the land freight costs, so depending on the size and weight of what you're reporting, it could be a... And local manufacturer, how does that fit in? Uh, so, the, um, the system of biobolts is quite low tech, so I think ultimately we could move into, the low, into local manufacture for that. The biorock system, um, there are septic tank manufacturers in Ghana, so we did consider using Ghana in septic tanks and kind of using the same media for biorock, but we thought for the first trial as a kind of control version, try not to change too much. So moving forward, we could use a local manufacturer for that. And then the biofill system is a manufacturer version. Okay, I think we're going to stop it there. And then Please take it at the end. Thank you very much. That's great. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who I hope is just doing the seat, because I can't actually see him right now. Um, he is Osbert Abidukwe, and he has a civil engineering degree from Makarere University, and he's currently doing his master's there as well in civil engineering. He also works for Water for People um, as a sanitation engineer and the Sani Hub coordinator and he heads the technical team for fecal sludge treatment there. And the title of this presentation is Testing a Low-Cost Decentralised Fecal Sludge Treatment System. Mm -hmm. Good evening. My name is Osbada Nuche, as she has said. I'm a professor of economics as well. I'm going to discuss about this in the low-cost fecal sludge treatment system and the common equality of the disaster management. We are doing it in partnership with the Water Sludge Commission. Uh, and Water Commission is an NGO that is based in the USA and its vision is to provide natural body access, safe water, and sanitation. And the 
Sun Hub, where the sanitation hub is the key program that ensures that we give sustainable sanitation through action and such. We hope our technologies in partnership with both local and international partners, and the key ones in Uganda we normally use case, we work with cases here, national water, and material cluster, and we have some space and work to use on this project. For those of you who don't know where Uganda is located, it's in the East African region. It's in the East African region, and our main roots in Kampala area where we do most of our projects. And this project I'm talking about is located in another part of Ghana. The FICO sludge, I don't take it for granted. Uh, it's sludge of very low consistency, which has been captured in our soil sanitation systems, like blood drains, septic tanks, and four flushes in blood. <laughs> and FICO sludge can be low, partially digested, censored. For example, this one here, in this case, which you know I have to see on our value plants, you can turn it as maybe censored sludge. You know the presentations I've seen have been seen for many things. Right of such thickness. Uh, overview of coastal management in Uganda. In most towns in Uganda we use wastewater separation ponds. We have about three professional treatment plants. And only one plant, and the recent one has been designed to handle people's life. And some towns which have no treatment plants at all and have taken some of our technologies as we saw yesterday, the garbers. When they garb, I think they just dig and burrow inside the sludge. That's how the situation is and they have nothing to come to them. Then the people study in Kampala, Kampala only has about 7% seaweed, and this is the biggest percent in the whole country. If you take it at the national level, it will be like 20 and 2 percent. And the structures we use are normally ordinary structures here in this and septic dams and some of our systems. And the key challenge we face, our city has a lot of traffic jam. You go the whole day, maybe you're going to empty a latrine, which has a lot of salt waste. Two hours you're fishing, two hours you're gardening, uh, the other two hours you're moving from maybe 10 kilometers of dumping site. You only use about six hours. One hour you're dumping, for the seven hours, you have eight hours to work, and you can't move around, you can't go back and so on. So, I've talked about Some of these places are not accessible, so you move about 100 meters to a pick up your load. Then you come and don't summarize how gardening business and how the treatments fit in the gardening business. And now, top the deepest pilot project. Uh, as you can see, the units under it, you have the inlet for the screening down. We saw yesterday that in this time, we normally have a lot of salt waste. So this time was basically to move the salt waste. Then we have the sedimentation unit, which we commonly call the, the watering unit, where the sludge is watered and some central waters are moved. Then we have a nopic forward in the other. This one we are looking at move of organic pollutants, this type. Then a nopic filters, we are looking at move of suspended soils. Then also we move some pathogens which can be trapped by that, by the which is expected to the meter. Then we have a nopic plant and global filter here, we are looking at move of smell and maybe this by color. Then we have uh, an unplanted drying bed which is roofed. So that even if it's a wet season, the drying is almost constant. And this is basically to do second real attached watering of the digested site from one digested site. And that's the schematic. If you look at it, it looks like what Florida is already doing is decentralized wastewater treatment systems. But here our only difference is that we are trying using plastic tanks. Some people in Uganda who may want to do gardening business cannot, may not handle all those concrete materials to establish a centralized treatment system. So we try to maybe use plastic tanks and submit what order accepted does and see how it performs and we shall see the results of what we are getting. That's a detailed drawing. I'm not going to it since we've got this in the schematic. The details you can you access my presentation here. And the key facts about our plant, it's on a small plant, <coughs> six by six plot. Uh, we are looking at about 500 liters of sludge per day. We are looking at the hydraulic rendition time of about 10 days under no conditions. I'm not considering the planted gravel filter. And we are looking at about three to five weeks for watering the unit. I know when conventional digesters should be like months or so, 
But here, this is what we have a rotary, uh, rotary unit. And we are receiving very thick sludge. So that's why it's more does of rotary than the annual edition. Then we are so far treated about 44 to 50 tons of sludge. And up to the rest is about 0.5. That was a conversation, and that was someone who paid us in the Some of the victorious, the plan, that's how the pipes are inside the town. And this is a show that is how they are ready. And this is our right bed. The results from the monitoring. Uh, the local treatment should improve its efficiency, should improve its time. So we are supposed to monitor maybe like every half a month. This was our first time, our first month of monitoring. We are looking at different concentrations. We are just looking at COD and BOD. Since we are doing actual research, we want to take it scale. But we have students who are going to other parameters, nutrients, pathogens, and so on. But our key ones were just called BOD and COD. Then you see the different, we are getting about 20 for COD and maybe 12,000 in the initial sampling for BOD and we reduce them by over 90 percent but if, since it's a very concentrated sludge the quality was still very poor the influence about 800 to about 1000 yet our discharge is standard is say about 100 for COD 100 for total suspended soils and 50 for COD so it was still up other sites, some results, maybe sample 3 this one was moving, the trend was a bit funny we are getting suspended soils reducing, but the POD and COD were remaining a bit more than a bit a thousand. So meaning the reduction was not so significant. And when we checked, was checked with our loading, what we loaded, what we loaded in that period, it was more septic sludge, which came from a septic tank, and it's normally already digested. So the reduction is not so significant, so it kept almost on the same curve. Then we are looking at some of five results here were almost meeting the discharge standards. We are able to reduce COD to about 143, our discharge is 100, then BOP was about 100, yet it's 50 required, uh, and the efficiency was also about 99 and so for us. Those of you who don't enjoy pop-ups, we have put a sample of where I turned some lines, and the trend is the same here, we are looking at efficiency so far, 93%, but this was sample for one. One for the sample five. The research standards here was 400 for BOD, 800 COD, and 340 for total suspended soils. Uh, what I, now it's very hard to compare what with the improvement with time. Because today we receive slides maybe from septic tank, tomorrow from a public artery, and tomorrow from an ordinary artery. We have no equalization tank, so we can't get a uniform influent quality. So we are now looking at each sampling we just see what we been able to move. Overall efficiency as I've said, we can see it's all almost generally about 70% to about 99 so plus. And these are just a summary of whatever I've been saying. We normally sample even if every unit is equipped with some sampling tab, we have a normal tab for example in a monthly basis. Physical challenges everybody yesterday was shouting who was doing empty was shouting about so west so west <coughs> It's a problem why empty and so a problem why empty. You get a lot of salt waste, personal I've never seen using pads. It's my first time to see them when I was doing with this slide. Uh, then we also have variation in properties of sludge. We could, they can vary from 1,000 to about 50,000. Now it's very hard to design for such a, a sludge. The organic loading rate, you can just have to be barren. Then accumulation of come and the biodigestion is affecting our biogas production, then it's not watering ability. If we get a better watering system, we could be able to treat more than 400 or 500 liters of sludge per day if we can be able to do our sludge in a very short time. About reducing progress, what we've been able to do, we are looking at using the biosurfaces themselves to do some agriculture. We are looking at, we've started producing some tickets. We are looking at biogas. And we are looking at vermi composting with stike worms. Uh, here we just roasted it with some dry sludge, but I put question marks on it because of what I'm about to say. <laughs> what 
conclusions, we can see our efficiency is about more than 70%, about 99%, but most of them actually are in the 90s. Though because of its strength, the discharge standard is still up a little. Then we have, I was recommending that we should, in the future when we are scaling up, I'm thinking of putting an information so that it can ensure I wrote my system uniformly. Whether it's from a septic tank, a picture of two mixed together, I can have an equal loading in terms of organic loading rate onto my system. Then, now off topic a little. Uh, in computer, computer language, they say garbage in, garbage out. Uh, cows or other animals take pathogenic feeds, they produce waste. We are all very happy to use it without fear. Man takes very delicious food with no pathogens. But when he gets out, what he gets out, we are all very sad about it, even when it smells or it doesn't smell. And as a result, we contaminate it more. Everybody think in my country, for example, a broken bottle taken in a latrine, a rug taken in a latrine, used tab, uh, meaning tablets taken in a latrine. As a result, it becomes so contaminated. Yet, when you look at it, if, for example, if this sludge had been dried and I just used it to roast my ways, I even have fear eating because I know the pathogens would have been killed in that part, in the fire. But because of what we put, poisons, you may eat that ash on the days and get sick. So if we could all become happy on using our food, on handling our food, because as this man is happy handling cow down, which even smells more than the feces, I think we would have this problem via treatment of our food sludge. That's the point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arsi. Thank you very much for that. It's definitely difficult trying to take such a very complete stop. I think it's just not. We've um, got time, I think, for a question at the back there. Yeah. Yes, hello. Uh, thanks, Oswald, for this very informative and actually excellent presentation. I'm always appreciating the work of what people are doing in Uganda. Last from Sami Um I was wondering about giving a very high level of CV at the incident of the ADRs of the mid production. And I did you all look into like, such accumulation rates inside the ADRs themselves when you were looking at you know, like the digestion rates and when they're doing the sampling and you have anything about the such accumulation rates inside the ADRs? The sludge accumulation rate in the ABRs, we have two tanks as I've said. Uh, let me this, this one here. We have this first tank and this one here. Uh, because of our very thick sludge, some sort of normal escape to this tank. We, it should, our design says when it gets to about a third of the tank head, we should desludge. But, that, but this one normally happens like in three months. For example, this plant has been operating. Uh, for seven months now, and we discharged in the October. It was getting almost half. But this other one, we haven't discharged still less than a third of the height of the tank. So, but I haven't considered, like, say, that you mentioned it for months, like this one. Great, thanks, Um, One more quick question. Um, uh, what is the pollution? Uh, levels in the outflow of the septic tank. You know, this is about the sludge. Probably you would have measured the pollution load in the uh, outflow coming out of the septic tank because you can't is actually covered with a comprehensive sewer system. Okay. Looking at only sludges from septic tanks, when we are designing for septic tanks, they give about three years sludging interval. And if the sludge has been kept for all that period of time, you expect it to have been undergone uh, complete, almost complete digestion. So maybe it could be in a thousand servants characterized specifically for septic tanks, but it shall maybe be less than even a thousand because it has been already digested inside the septic tanks. But for latrines and public latrines especially, there you get very young sludge, which is normally so concentrated in terms of Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you.
treatment of fecal material from urine diverting composting toilets, could I ask the speaker to come forward and introduce themselves? Because unfortunately, I don't know why I'm sorry. Oh, this is <coughs> Um, the Director of the Institute of Environmental Science and Engineering at Hanoi University of Civil Engineering. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, in fact, uh, my PhD student should present this paper. Uh, but uh, we have uh, some work, so we have decided to uh, invite the works today. I, this is my turn. So I'm happy to uh, present this paper on behalf uh, of the whole team. Uh, you know that uh, we are facing a uh, problem of uh, fast uh, filling up the pit uh, of the on-site sanitation uh, systems. And um, here, the, the way we are trying to do is uh, to enhance uh, the decomposition process uh, of the pit and uh, after the pit, so that uh, we could have a safe uh, fertilizer use in uh, our country. Uh, This, uh, this is the, the, the ongoing work, and uh, we'd like to uh, present to you the initial results. Uh, in Vietnam, most of the uh, uh, pit latrines uh, are added uh, after every time of use, the ash, uh, and sometimes they add the uh, lime, they think that uh, it is uh, hygienic. But uh, because of adding uh, high pH, ash and lime, we have very high pH environment. And uh, it kills also useful bacteria into the pit, uh, in the pit. And uh, from the previous presentation in the morning session today from our team, you will see uh, there is almost no uh, biological decomposition uh, within the pit. So we have to enhance it either within the pit or after it. Uh, so one way to do it is uh, try to find a uh, cheap aerobic composting process uh, to further decompose uh, the fecal material. Um, and here, uh, what uh, we are trying to do is uh, to introduce the aerobic composting with the manual uh, <coughs> steering uh, so that we could have a better aerobic condition. And uh, we try to find uh, local bioactives which are available in the market and which are cheap, uh, which uh, have the good decomposition of hydrocarbon uh, carbon hydrate, uh, or, which have uh, also ratified uh, and good enzymes for decomposition. Uh, so uh, here we are testing the composting after the pit uh, using uh, the drum system. This is a cheap uh, plastic uh, uh, drum. Uh, this is one assist. And man manually, from time to time, you can rotate it. Uh, and uh, we add uh, the fecal material together with the sawdust to control moisture. Uh, we add it uh, organic uh, organic waste and here we add uh, food waste uh, to uh, control the c 2 m ratio and uh, from time to time the drum is uh, rotated we have uh, different uh, drum uh, with different mixing ratios and different uh, types of uh, bioactives these are uh, parameters we are analyzing we measure also temperature over the time. This is automatic uh, temperature record uh, put uh, inside the, the pipe, inside the drum. Uh, the, the first drum, we, we add a fecal material uh, with uh, the bioadditive called uh, Shaggy Bio. It is a combination of uh, uh, carbon hydrates Uh, and uh, food waste. The, the second drum we add uh, with the 
alcohol yeast, which is a very local material in the market, and uh, farmers use that to prepare alcohol. Uh, it should uh, have a good uh, carbon hydrate and decomposition. For quest and solace for control moisture, moisture and uh, situation nature. And the, the control uh, drum is uh, just a uh, fecal material and uh, solace. Without priority. Uh, so the results uh, we see here the the temperature uh, of, the, of the first and second round significantly increased, especially for the first round we reached uh, 44 degrees, which was very good, while the ambient temperature was uh, around 20. For the uh, round three, uh, we, we didn't have it. Ambient in the region. Uh, this graph shows the VS, uh, VS reduction. Uh, we don't have much uh, VS reduction uh, as expected. And, uh, nitrogen reduction is significantly uh, happening in the drum one uh, because of high temperature. Uh, rapid mineralization uh, of organic compounds. Uh, very good results in the E. coli uh, reduction. Uh, in the drum one, we have uh, after four months, uh, four watts reduction. Uh, the same in the drum two, uh, four watts. But in the blind drum, we have uh, one lock reduction. Uh, conclusion. Uh, with a local available uh, bioanalytic, we can enhance the decomposition uh, process uh, after the pit. Uh, and uh, we may also apply priority also within the pit. Uh, we can reach uh, the temperature <coughs> can we come to the papers now? Papers. No, okay, next. <coughs> next, next. Forward, yes. Uh, with the uh, Shaggy Bio, this is locally uh, uh, produced uh, priority made uh, for solid waste uh, treatment. We could uh, increase the temperature in ground rapidly reach uh, 44 degrees within a few days, first few days. And uh, that uh, led uh, to the idea to uh, enhance the uh, uh, mixing process uh, with an easier operated, uh, operating system. And uh, these results lead us to uh, create a new uh, prototype of a new uh, composting toilet, which uh, you see is in, in the booth, uh, here in the corridor, uh, where we have a screw, and manually you can uh, rotate uh, the fecal material, we, we can mix it, and uh, there is a pipe where you can add the sawdust and the bio additives, if uh, you, you can. So this is uh, the idea to uh, enhance the decomposition process, and we see it, it works, so it's one of the potential ways to improve the big action. Thank you very much. from Pakistan, and I have a single question with you, please. You have talked again and again about temperatures to control the uh, uh, feces and management. Would you please discuss how do people uh, control the pH level for all this process? And second one, you use sawdust. And is it possible to use any other things like ash, like uh, tissue papers, 
to accumulate and uh, uh, moisture control as well. And the skin ratio, as you have discussed, uh, I think so. Uh, this is a little bit below than than is internationally and scientifically required. And the fourth one is uh, why as you people use the vermicomposting composting or uh, humidifications in your uh, products as well. If not, how do people deal the ground uh, water contamination about its bleaching material as well? Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Should I answer back to, to the other questions? Uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, adding material, we, we have a different way. And uh, any local uh, material you can find, which uh, can uh, provide the... Because uh, in, in this toilet, if uh, the moisture is there, you cannot have uh, good uh, aeration. You cannot have aerobic decomposition. So uh, moisture is important. And we know that uh, good uh, moisture uh, value is the uh, aerobic composting, 60 percent, uh, 55, 65. So uh, the, the, the role of solace is there. Uh, besides, we have uh, some C to N control. Uh, you can add some uh, uh, rice straw, but not ash. Uh, ash uh, may increase pH significantly, and uh, all the good pathogens can, can die off. So uh, the way you can do with the ash is uh, we went in the beginning, and uh, after that you don't add uh, every day. You you, you take the material out and start to, to do composting with other um, materials. Uh, we did a very careful uh, analysis, microbial analysis, uh, with the College for Little School of Hygiene. Uh, much, much less uh, microbial community in the pit latrine material uh, where people add ash and lime, much less by microbial community diversity. Uh, yeah, groundwater contamination. Uh, this is a good way to protect groundwater if you have a dry toilet, if you have compost. And uh, they, they are building above ground, they are not using uh, water, and uh, they are not discharging uh, wastewater to, to, to the ground. Uh, of course, you have to be in the right place where it's not flooded uh, and far from the water well. So, uh, this is a way to protect groundwater. Uh, of course, the system is a bit. Uh, I would like to address the first question if I, 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 I uh, correctly. Uh, this is uh, this is not simple system. So you uh, we, we have in the, in the booth. Uh, you see, you have uh, we have a screw, and uh, we try to reduce the cost of, of the device and uh, make it simpler as much as possible, uh, to be, uh, usable for, for for people. Was there one further question from that? C to N ratio, I think. Yeah, we, we know the, the best C to N ratio for composting is uh, 25 30 C to N. And we, we try to achieve it. And by adding uh, other types of waste, uh, if you can, then we can give, uh, we, we can try different types of waste and then give uh, advice to the farmers. One more question. Well, uh, thank you, Ruth, for giving me the floor here. Uh, 
I am uh, representing Brad Water Sanitation and Hygiene Program, and the topic will be uh, reuse of fecal sludge as organic fertilizer in context of Bangladesh Brad Wash Initiative. Basically, uh, I have to confess that we are going to talk about the rural situation of Bangladesh. And before starting my presentation, I would like to thank Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for supporting me. Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, in our program, uh, we have provided more than one million double pit latrine has grant to the other poor people. So uh, here you can see the model we are following. People use the first pit. Uh, then when it's filled up, then they go to the second one. So uh, they need to be emptied uh, to keep them usable. And the question comes to our mind that uh, what to do with the biggest lab after emptying. <coughs> so uh, from this point of view, we have designed the research. Uh, and in next few slides, I will uh, tell you about the research. I mean, what, what are the things we have done. Uh, the research uh, aims to actually meet the nutrient content at national organic fertilizer standard and uh, contribute to the agricultural system of Bangladesh through figure sludge based organic fertilizer. Uh, I have to tell a little about the national organic fertilizer standard because Bangladesh Agriculture Ministry has its own standard for organic fertilizer, uh, which is more or less similar to the international standard. And uh, we are focusing on the second point uh, very carefully. That's because uh, in that case, I have talked about our agricultural system a bit. Uh, Bangladeshi farmers mostly depend on the chemical fertilizer for their cultivation. And you know that uh, this is not very good for the soil in the long run. So at the time, we are planning to uh, compensate the soil uh, for the nutrient uh, through the fecal based organic fertilizer. Uh, in the pictures, you can see that how we are actually planning to do our work. So uh, here you can see that uh, how the anaerobic digestion occurs. Basically, uh, as uh, when the first feed filled up, uh, people start using the second feed. So naturally, the smell remains uh, inside the feed for around more or less 18 months. So uh, anaerobic digestion is the process uh, continues during that period. Uh, we, have, we have started our uh, sample analysis uh, by collecting sample from seven uh, climatic zones. You can see it on our right in the picture. Uh, we have collected 10 samples uh, per zone. So and after collecting the samples, we have done physical and chemical uh, parameters of this uh, seven samples. At the time, we have done microbial and uh, pathogenic analysis as well. So uh, in, in, in we can see that there are some uh, deficiencies in nutrient. Uh, one is that the moisture level is uh, too high, and they are uh, a bit low in pH and also below in potassium. So uh, what we have done is that we have gone for uh, co-composting with sawdust and sun drying. Uh, why we have gone for sun drying, I will tell you in the next slide. But uh, we have done co-composting with sawdust. Basically, we can we can do that with other uh, agricultural residues as well. But as uh, in the countryside, I mean, in the villages, sawdust is available, we have preferred to use the sawdust. Here uh, in the graph, you can see uh, that how this procedure helps us to raise the pH, uh, make the moisture lower, and increase the potassium content. OK, uh, here comes uh, the pathogen part. Uh, though we have sampled uh, after uh, 18 months of storage, still uh, there were anaerobic digestion. But still, we have found uh, some pathogen in the slurs. So that's why we have applied sun drying. And you can see that after sun drying, after seven days of drying, uh, we have found no E. coli in the sample. After 15 days of uh, drying, we have found that there is no Clostridium parthensis. But it's the helminths, or uh, more precisely the helminth eggs, they are so persistent that it took around 60 days to uh, make all the helminth eggs uh, not viable. Because uh, actually, if they do present, I mean, 
they remain in the slug, but in a non-viable form. So uh, here in this slide, you can see that uh, actually uh, what in the, in the graph you can see that how we have moved and on which phase we are right now. Uh, we have done uh, we have done the nutrient development part, we have done the passenger removal part, and we have completed the field trial as well. You can see two pictures. Uh, we have done field trial on rice and on cabbage actually. So uh, this part has been completed, and right now uh, we are working on marketing, uh, marketing and supply chain development. Basically, before going to the next slide, I have to say one thing that uh, we uh, have one advantage uh, in working in the rural area than, than the urban part that's because the ultimate target uh, of reuse of figures uh, is the farmers I and mean, they are our target customer so uh, the advantage is they are actually in the rural part so uh, the customers are in the surrounding so one entrepreneur can easily collect the slash from his surroundings, he can go compost it, and he can sell it to his nearby farmers. Uh, so obviously the transportation cost uh, minimizes a lot, so there is no question of external funding or subsidy, uh, the whole business can remain viable by itself. Uh, before completion, I would like to inform you about uh, some other works we are currently doing on uh, figure slug management. Uh, here you can see we are also trying to do co composting of figure slugs with uh, kitchen and market waste. Uh, in the diagram you can see, uh, see the idea of it. We are also uh, trying to do uh, biogas generation from the mix of figure slugs, corn stover, and chicken manure. And at the time, uh, we are trying to introduce mechanical patenting through Vanguard. Actually, uh, we, are, we do work in the rural area, but uh, these three action resources are for the villagers, those who are in the uh, surroundings of small towns or towns. So uh, we are, um, along with our ongoing work, we are trying to uh, introduce these things as well. So this is. Actually, uh, from my part, thank you very much for listening. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Uh, actually, thanks to all our speakers for keeping the time so nicely. Um, can I take any questions? Moritz Wolf from Air Box, and thanks for the excellent presentations. I'm here. Um, I have a question, uh, helmet eggs, um, you said there were different climates, zones, how was the distribution of helmet eggs in the sludge which was digested after these 18 months, were there some where they were totally inactivated, what was kind of, was there a certain percentage, some pattern you saw, because, yeah, some people are saying, I mean in other countries also, other people say, oh, there's totally die off and they just use it, they, like we, it seems there's no understanding of, well, uh, I have to say that it's really not very easy to kill all the helmets uh, in just one process because if you review the uh, papers, you will find that there are different papers and every uh, single paper is talking about every new technology and temperature to uh, kill the helmets. But in our research, we have found that, uh, as I have already mentioned, that there are seven climatic zones. Uh, some, uh, especially uh, those who are in the southern part, there are, uh, the moisture is a bit high in the soil, and in those areas we have found that uh, the hydrants are actually still viable, I mean after 18 months. And for uh, that reason we have to we have to apply the laser drying. Otherwise in the northern part we have found that most cases there are no hydrants, and in some cases we have found hydrants, but the eggs are not actually viable. Uh, yeah, in fact, a very good presentation about a uh, closed loop system. So, environmentally, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but have you done any analysis of the perceptions of the 
adopters of two pit toilet about acceptability of this toilet vis a vis other toilet, as well as acceptability of the farmers of this particular and uh, whether any perception of the stakeholder conservation. <coughs> Well, uh, I would love to answer that question. Well, when we have started our program, uh, definitely we have started our program with single pit lattice. But when we have talked with the people, we have tried to analyze the perception of the people, those who are in the countryside. And after having their perception, we have started to uh, provide double pit lattice. So definitely uh, we are doing this with their consent. And uh, uh, can, can I have the, uh, can you repeat the second question again? Perception of the farmers about acceptability of this as a organic manual. Well, uh, when we have started our uh, because of the management part, I mean the research in uh, that period we have uh, we have done a complete survey on the willingness of the farmers to use that. Uh, you will find it rather interesting that when we have asked the farmers whether you are going to use that as a farm, organic fertilizer in your field, everybody, almost everybody answered that no, we are not going to use that. But when we have uh, told them that after the digestion period, the slash fertilizer will be completely odorless, uh, it will be grinded, so uh, will be in a very easily usable and good looking form. Then they replied that yes, we can use that. And we have done that actually, we have uh, prepared the slash as organic fertilizer and when we have delivered that to the farmers, in then they have uh, said that yes, we can use that. And the, uh, you have uh, seen two uh, pictures of field trial where uh, uh, we have done that with local farmers, no research farms. So uh, then they have replied that yes, we can do that and we can do that easily. That's it. We can take one more question. Uh, just a follow up question as well on the last one. I'm thinking a little bit about the marketing and supply chain development. And just what I see into these rural areas is some farmers are okay to dump it on their own land. And so, how, how are we going to convince them to use this more sophisticated system? Um, because I think the farmers who would quickly uptake this technology or quickly use it are the farmers that possibly would be using um, waste that they would take out of their own pit, they self empty, and then lay it on their crops. So how would you, what's the marketing going to look like? Uh, well, uh, we are not expecting that it will be done just like that. Well, definitely it will take time, but what we are focusing on is that uh, we are trying to uh, develop a kind of plot demonstration in different areas of Bangladesh. And uh, previously we have seen that uh, except talking and uh, advocating the farmers. Uh, plot demonstration is a very good way to convince them. I believe we have already done that in some areas and uh, definitely we are going to implement it in the other parts also. Uh, I think we'll have to leave it there, but I think we will have time for a panel discussion afterwards, so we'll take one question for them. So thank you. Thank you. Thereafter, if they were abused and filled up rapidly, 
the owner will pay for cost of entry pits. And we are only talking about VIP pits here. We're not talking about uni toilets or anything like that. We're purely talking about the VIP pits. Um, 2007, we have bought, uh, we, we decided to claim 35,000 pits, which is how many VIP we have in the area. Um, and to use vapor, because we found it was the most cost effective method of working, especially with our pits. Our pits are dry pits so generally, um, they're not wet. Um, so that was, the, uh, that was the best method. And we we're going to suppose that the slabs are the most environmentally acceptable method. Uh, the contract was advertised, it's a three year contract, we're limited to three years in our country. Um, um, and through our procurement section, we employed six subcontractors. We in turn employed uh, six teams made up of six people. That was the, that was the staff complement to do a pit in. Key issues with the contract that we would have was health and safety. Every, every person that worked on it was given a medical, was given an entry medical and an exit medical, a provider with work tablets. Um, tools and equipment, we had all various types of tools and equipment that we used to be developed on site. Um, removal of sludge from the site was not easy, but we, we got it and, and disposal of sludge. Those were, the, those were the key issues that we had to deal with. Very early on in, in the contract, we found that there was problems, space and access. A lot of these places where they had VRPs had been infilled and it was very difficult to get in and around them. Pathogens, in, in Iptek Queenie we have a major problem with the story. Um, and uh, we found that the pathogens we thought would die after 18 months. Some tests were done with the UK Zealand University and Colin Archer and co. And we found that after 15 years, 14 years, there was still evidence of, 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 of life, life exploding. Water, excess water, sludge has got excess water in it. Detritus, we have a bad problem with detritus in our areas. We've got it's full of rags and bottles and all sorts of stuff that comes in the extra pit the tree. And then sludge disposal. Um, that's the, that was the problem. That, that became the big problem. So what we thought about it, sludge disposal, we, we thought that we would bury on site, then we found those space constraints. You couldn't actually bury on site, and also we found that due to the pathogen problem, we didn't want to bury sludge on site that was full of pathogens. We there for at least 14 years. Disposal of the landfill sites, we have quite strong environmental laws in South Africa and it's very costly. Um, to dispose to the, to, the, to, the, to the landfill site would have cost for this project in the criminal about $5.7 million. Um, and besides which we're just purely taking up landfill airspace with, with sludge. Uh, so, disposal of the treatment books. This is where we had a problem. We shut down one of our treatment works. When we took it there, we thought we were doing the right thing. We'd simply wash it in the screening system here. We'd take all the detritus out, bag of detritus, put it in the sewage works, and yeah, that's what a sewage works is for, to treat the sludge. We overloaded the digesters. Nitrogen load was way out. So, so at the end of the day, we actually closed down that treatment works. It's not, it's not a normal treatment works, not designed to take all this additional sludge. And what you normally say is that out of out of desperation comes innovation. And this is when we started the birth of what we call the DEPA. And the DEPA machine is, we call it the DEPA because so it's, it's a nice African sound. And it stands for latrine dehydration and pasteurization. This is the drawings that we drew up in a little office in Cape Town, a couple of mechanical engineers, Aga, us ourselves. And we, and we come up with a system that looks like that. Basically what it is, is that you have extruders. So they are screw compacting extruders that have an opening, an opening to the far end. So you put your sludge and detritus in one end, it compacts the sludge, the sludge gets forced through the holes there, those are six millimeter to between six and nine millimeter holes. It squeezes them out like a spaghetti. The, the, the detritus passes and can't go through the holes and that comes out the end of the screw and that can get bagged. This falls onto an open por a porous belt that travels around and it falls in an open matrix and that's the key to the whole thing because what you have as it, as it passes along this open belt, it goes through a pre-drying system which is a waste of heat from the genset and then it goes into uh, medium wave infrared radiators and that process from there to there takes about 16 minutes. Yeah, so it's eight minutes, yeah, 16 minutes from there to there. It, um, 
it is also a vacuum, so it pulls the hot air through the actual through the through the um, through the porous belt. And when it comes out the other side there, it pulls out in a, in a dry print form. It's not totally dry, it's around about 66 to 67 70% solids. When it comes in here, our sludge is coming in at around about 25%, between 25 and 35% solids. And when it comes out the other side there, it comes out, it's depathogenized. That's what it looks like as we do the process of building the plant. That is the plant there. This is the screw extruder that runs through the back there. This is the pre drying set. This is the uh, infrared. That's what the screws, what the spaghetti look like when they get rinsed through these little holes and they fall in the open porous belt. That's the end of the machine, and this is what it looks like when it comes out there. That's what actually happens. Then it gets on site to its bag. The, um, puts it into white bags and ready for transport to where you can take it. The whole, the whole unit is situated in two containers. It's in a 40 foot container and a 20 foot container. And it's all plug and play. You can pick it up, you can take it where you like, and put it down and start operating. Operating costs, uh, to, to purchase a plant, that's in rands, so it's about $640,000 purchase. The average operating cost, we look at back to, to prepare it to cost that's 0.5 of a liter of diesel per person per year. If you're looking at the treatment works in South Africa, it's around about 0.9 of a liter to one liter per person per year. That's your costs. That's changed a little bit now with the, with the, with the, with the $45 petrol, uh, diesel price. It has one supervisor and, and five general workers. That's all it takes to operate this plant. It's very simple, it's very basic. Uh, test carried out in the sludge, we are solid capacity. It, it, can, it can cope with solids between 25 and say 40%. After that, it's too dry, before it's too wet. Uh, we have post processing. Well, we have quite a bad scoring problem in, 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 in ETEC really. Tests were done, and the scoring was on about 50 grams or something like 1,000 eggs. When it went through the process, there wasn't one live egg left. It was carefully looked at by, by, by the people in the course of the University. NPK, NPK values, uh, it's about 3 to 1, but it's very low. It's about 2% of the of per weight. So in other words, if your fertilizer is normally sitting about 22% per, per, per volume, this is about 2%. We did some trials, some engineering trials, these were um, agricultural trials were done by engineers. And what we did was no fertilizer, fertilizer, and we used three times the volume of fertilizer in pellets. After 19 days, that's the results. That's on, 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 on lettuce and spinach. It was actually quite a good fertilizer. This is our new program. Uh, how are we going to operate? Uh, we, as a municipality, are an employee managing contractor. We will lease this plant in to, to supply to a managing contractor. So if something goes wrong with the managing contract, it doesn't walk away with the plant. So we lease the plant in. Managing contractor will then operate the plant first, he will empty BRPs, um, and then he will also look at sales and fertilizer to farmers, etc. It can be used as an ordinary treatment works, provided it's um, standard works with digesters and set tanks. We don't do activated job, uh, activated sludge because it's too smooth. We, we put it through the process, we, we, we wet it again, it's very, very smooth. So basically, what we have there is just a situation where you have a different 10,000 plant. It provides a sanitation solution, it provides a health solution, employment for the people that work in the area, and it's a food security solution. So basically, it's a simple, simple technology. Addresses technical and environmental challenges, addresses our, our political social ambitions via service provision, food sustainability, job opportunities, land for preservation, subsistence in agriculture. It's a low cost solution and, and first of all, it's water.
Are there any questions at this stage? It's going to be launched very shortly on by an Australian company, I believe, uh, being called La Deva Global. Um, so it will be coming to the market shortly. It's on all the websites. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think we had a question here from the middle. Yeah, thank you for a very uh, informative and interesting presentation. From the National University of uh, Civil Engineering kind of Vietnam. Um, uh, I just uh, I, I like uh, all the process, and uh, I just wonder at the very beginning you mentioned about uh, so the input of your ladder uh, uh, power technology, like this is that uh, from every five year recycle, like this is a slot um, that uh, go to your technology. You can those ones are like, like collected every five years. So I, I just wonder uh, what a different like five years collect the stuff and one or two years um, stuff. Okay, okay, I think I can answer it. We we, we empty our printed beans once every five years. So we have a process. So we will we, we sweep the area. We start in one one spot and we work our way across the tip really. We, we, we have, we're just leasing three more plants, we have four plants. We need four plants to treat the amount of sludge and we have to go over a five year period. So you, you just purely keep going through the area and, and that sludge gets treated and the pellet dies and the pellets can get used. We're using the pellets in our community gardens, um, you know, community gardens and, and, and in, our, in our parks and gardens department we're using as well at this stage. Realized that if you have the right adaptive reactor, 
and you add your, your, your urine with an external magnesium source, you stir, and you open the taps to release the effluents. Strategically, you remove the seed, you dry it, and the precipitate will device to form what we have as trubite. What was our interest in carrying out this study? Um, previous mates of the laboratory conducted some work on fecal sludge leachate and discovered considerable amounts of nutrients in leachate after treating fecal sludge with planted dewatering berries. And since we know that the strubite technology has served as high-end solution to accommodate fertilizer shortages, our intention was to find out if this could also serve as a strategy to punish the leachate we obtained from planted dewatering beds. Hence, the major objective of this study was to precipitate struvite from fecal sludge leachate with an eye on the cost. In order to do this, ladies and gentlemen, we had to obtain magnesium in the form of wood ash from Susa in the littoral province of Cameroon. And we had to purchase magnesium chloride, which served as our solid test, mindful of other experiments that have been conducted with it to prove that it's possible. We bought it from Yaoundé. And then we were supplied fecal sludge by mechanized vehicles, emptying trucks. We kept it in a storage container from which it was applied to non-planted dewatering beds. And after some time, we obtained the leachate in vats. Um, to get urine, which served as our control, upon consent with the other officials, the departmental toilets, precisely the male urina of the Department of Plant Biology in the Faculty of Science, University of Yaoundé, were adapted to and connected to a five liter gallon pipe tubing and with this setup we could collect about 20 liters of urine within three to four weeks. Um, prior to precipitation tests, samples of our solvent or solutions were taken to the lab where they were analyzed for physical chemical parameters as well as phosphate and nitrogenous nutrients following standard protocols. Furthermore, an adapted reactor was created from local materials, suiting the model that was used in the power of the Our precipitation experiments were conducted in two phases. On the one hand, we had to precipitate struvite from urine and from leachate using magnesium chloride as, as source of magnesium. And on the other hand, we had to do that using wood ash. For each precipitation experiment, we had three repetitions. And some other initial considerations had to do with the dosage of wood ash, 15 grams per liter, the dosage of magnesium salt, 4 grams per liter. We settled at 15 minutes for stirring time and 45 minutes for settling time. And the drying depended on, of course, the weather conditions. With these, ladies and gentlemen, we came up with the following results. Um, you realize that the pH of leachate is almost neutral as compared to the pH of urine. And this was the case both before and after precipitation experiments. Uh, we compared it here with total dissolved solids, which was also low, 138 milligrams per liter for leachate before and it dropped after, while we had 444 milligrams per liter in urine, which also increased after. Uh, these results are in cooperation with the works of Benda, which explains the fact that when you apply fecal sludge on dewatering beds, there is some consequent mineralization that occurs, and that explains for the pH. Um, Furthermore, studies prove that struvite has a minimum solubility and pH greater than 9 or equal to 9, without which it cannot be precipitated. It was therefore not surprising that in the course of our experiments, we could not precipitate struvite from fecal sludge leachate. However, with urine, we could get some quantities of struvite from the salt, both in the case where we use magnesium chloride and in the case where we use wood ash. Uh, this go along with confirm the results of Kochefe and collaborators, Sativer and collaborators, as well as Ethan. Struvite precipitates only at pH greater than 0.9 to 9. 
We also compared the nutrient contents and our results corroborate with the results of Garland showing that nitrogenous nutrients are highest in wastewater, precisely in urine. Furthermore, phosphates are the slightest nutrient content in wastewater, hence their determinant nature. You must ascertain the fact that you have phosphates in your solution before you can attempt to precipitate urine. Um, we evaluated the magnesium, the total phosphorus, and the total nitrogen content in our leaching, and we obtained the following results. There was an increase from 0 0.49 to 3.3 milligrams a litre of magnesium in the effluents after precipitation. And as for total phosphorus and total nitrogen, the gas nitrogen, there was a sharp decrease from 88 to 51 and from 391 to 193 milligrams per liter respectively. Um, these results corroborate with the conclusions of Strandi and Linda Strandi and collaborators as well as Kenya in 2000, which all go a long way to declare, first of all, that magnesium is limited in wastewaters, and secondly, that phosphates are the minimum nutrients in wastewaters. Um, we tried to analyze the strobites we produced, and quite interesting was the fact that um, the magnesium content in strobite from salt precipitation uh, was more than that with ash, while uh, the inverse was true with total nitrogen and total phosphorus, which increased in the strobite produced from wood ash, other than the strobite produced using magnesium salt. Our results also revealed traces of sodium, calcium, and potassium in the struvite. And ladies and gentlemen, we conclude by saying that no struvite is produced from fecal sludge leachate, but the results are not enough basis for us to conclude that definitely struvite cannot be precipitated from fecal sludge leachate. It is therefore an ongoing current research proposal that we want to see if we can adjust the pH according to protocols determined or postulated by Nezeng and Zeyam in 2006, which involve titrations with sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid solutions to bring up the pH. Um, we are trying to, at this point, manage wood shavings and sawdust. We are thinking of the possibility of incinerating it at a specific temperature, as postulated by Sativelli and collaborators, to increase the magnesium content, all in a bit to get wood ash as a low cost magnesium source for the process. So we want to verify a PhD level if that is feasible. And we are also trying to see the possibility of creating a motorized and industrialized adapter with a motorized terror. And finally, we want to verify Detailly, the composition of the struvite produced, mindful of the fact that we realized that it had some traces of sodium, potassium, and calcium. Um, permit me to round up by acknowledging the following people, ladies and gentlemen. This research topic was suggested by Ewa Sandé and it will be directed the work, which, of course, was carried out at the University of Yaoundé One. And uh, the work was funded by the Swiss Agency for Development. And last but not least, we are grateful to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who made the presentation possible before you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, before we go to questions, um, just an announcement. The wedding ring was lost in this room sometime before 4 p.m. If that was your ring, can you come and find me just now when the questions start? And you can tell me what was written inside it to identify it. Um, if it's not someone in this room, we'll then go and ask around in the other room. So if you come and find me now, I'll see the questions start. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions at this stage? Uh, Elena. Hi, is that a glass for everybody or just this uh, presentation? Ah, just for a case that I'll post two questions and then I'll get everyone up here. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I'd like to know about 
the I see the strata is a complex compound. Yes. I'd like to know how the availability of the nitrogen, because I think it's the main uh, element you're looking for for plants. How is it available for plants in that complex? Um, Struvite, Struvite, thank you for your question. Struvite is a slow release bioavailable fertilizer, I earlier said. And uh, it is sparingly soluble. It only precipitates when the pH is above 9. Um, the tests in Ethiopia by Dalecha were presented some time ago, as well as other tests in Nepal by Bastian Eta have proven that it has a slow, it's, it's slow release nature makes it better than many synthetic fertilizers. So um, I think it's something we are looking at deeply in the lab with my conclusions, but for now what we can say is we are thinking that by virtue of its nature as a slow release fertilizer, the elements of erosion and weather don't quickly wash it off the soil especially in environments like us where we have rains. So, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Okay. Any other questions for me? Uh, thank you. Uh, I have just uh, one question. Um, how do you um, control uh, the proportion? By mixing the, the magnesium source with the grain or with the stage. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I'm glad you are asking and you are somebody in the terrain. I was just talking with you this afternoon with respect to issues of the like. I'm mindful of the fact that it was an innovative work in our environment, we thought it wise to go back to literature. And Sativel and collaborators used about 18 grams, uh, grams, grams of, of wood ash per liter when working with uranium. So we decided, mindful of the fact that it was a pilot and a test research work, to make it up to 15, since we understand the dynamics of the differences in wood ash content. And then Bastian Eta, working with, um, I think, magnesium oxide in Nepal, used 4 grams of magnesium source per liter of solution of urine. So we made it up to, to five to five grams. These are some of the elements we put in place to come up with um, what I would call supposed measures for the experiment. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Uh, by a miracle, we're running before time. So if I can ask all the speakers to come up now and we'll have any questions for any of them. So all six speakers, if they can come to the front. Question there on the end of the front. Then, hello. Um, thank you for everybody for your presentation. Um, well, I have a, only one commentary for two addition for the LEPA process and one question for the last speaker. But about the commentary of the LEPA, I wanted to say if you are interested in see some results about the pellets. We, because I, I work, I forget to introduce myself, I work with David Wilson in, in Potan University and we have a small LADEPA, a small prototype LADEPA. So if you're interested to see some results about LADEPA, or the drying kinetics and the um, characterization of the pellets, we have a poster outside, um, you, just in the, in the beginning of the half, at the right, there is a poster of LADEPA if you're interested to see the result. Now, for the last uh, speaker, I have a question. Have you calculated the potential with um, based on the composition of phosphates of, the, of, the, um, of your leach yet? Do you know the maximum the, the potential production of strobity? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for, for your question. Um, our main objective for this study was to verify if at all it's possible to precipitate struvite from fecal sludge leaching. So that would have been a sequel kind of trial. We would have followed up if the results were positive. But since the results were negative, we, we could not do anything to, to calculate potential. 
So we hope that at the pH level now, when we adjust the pH, we can ascertain whether or not it's possible to precipitate stroma, then we'll proceed to calculate potential. Thank you. Hi. Thank you all for your very interesting presentation. I have a question. My name is Hester Foppen from the Netherlands Aqua for All. I have a question for, for David Wilson from ET Queen. Um, what would you identify as um, the major obstacle for um, the commercial replication of the blood vapor technology? Why wouldn't it be possible to, to spread it and to scale it uh, at the commercial side? Um, I can talk for what happens in South Africa. Um, we are looking to do that. Um, we don't have big volumes currently in the tech community, but the person who holds the patent on it, he is the person that's going to be licensing the product. So we have to go through our Department of Agricultural and Environment Affairs, and they have to actually then license it with them, and they have to have lots of checks and balances in place to make sure that it's, 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 it's kept at a safe level for distribution. So he will, he will, he will take up that, that, that process. We, we're not going to do it because the volumes that we have doesn't warrant it. We, we, we we're processing like 10,000 cubic meters a year. It um, doesn't come close to what, what we require for fertilizers and we've been out of the province. But, but we will use it internally. Um, but then as it, hopefully if it does start to, 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 to spread to other areas within South Africa, it will then we will do the licensing and it will be commercialized. I can add to that if I may. Um, there will be another presentation tomorrow afternoon which does touch on the, the factors which affect the viability of, of treatment processes, including Miladepa, as part of the FSM chain and sort of the factors that can be adjusted to make it more or less viable. And that is a shameless self plug for my own presentation tomorrow afternoon. Um, I think the lady up in the green show there on the front row. I'm Nita Pokhre from Asian Development Bank. I think uh, we are all excited about Lade Bank. So um, I hope you keep the name. It's lovely, rolls off the tongue. Uh, but uh, we look forward to seeing it in the market. I, I think the lady touched upon some of my questions. My question was, what are the obstacles you've had or problems that you would say wouldn't work in these situations, but you're saying you're working on that. Also, the uh, issue you said it's fairly low cost. What are you talking about for 35,000 uh, pits? I, 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 uh, I guess it's 35,000 households, correct? So what are we talking about in terms of capital cost there? And um, up to, I mean, has there been any thought on up to what could be the upscaling of it, maximum capacity to what? Uh, or maybe you're still working on that but still excited about that. Uh, so I'll come and visit you post-roll. Thank you. Um, okay, we, we, we are upscaling at the moment. As I said to you, we started with one, one trial unit. Um, we just right now are busy. We've got a lease route. The cost, as I said earlier, is, is about $600,000. We're in grants to dollars. That's the, that's, the, that's the cost of the plant. We have gone the lease route because it's slightly cheaper, but we also lock the supplier in, whereas he can't just sell us the plant and walk away. So we pay him on a monthly basis over that period of time. So he, he, he gets a maintenance contract and, and a lease contract. So he will maintain the plant by over that period of time. So that's what we've done. So we are scaling in the tech way. Um, we're going to now be processing all our stuff, all our BRP stuff, because of the possibility of removing the detritus without having to do the machine takes it out on its own. Gentlemen at the back there. Also, just um, before we have any more questions, if anyone has any comments as to sort of take home messages from the session, please feel free to share those now as well. Oh, thanks very much for the evidence. My name is Sampan Kopal and I represent part of the people here. My question is to Mr. Day, uh, on the 20th day. Uh, I would like to know what is the pillar rate. Uh, uh, that is fit, fit, fit model, uh, how much time did it take to build up one, one pit? And what is the age of the tiling you have yesterday? 
Well, I, I have understood your first question. Can you repeat the second one? What is the uh, age of your toilet that you have uh, uh, taken for testing? Well, uh, uh, I'm uh, answering the first one first. Well, uh, usually it took uh, 12 to 14 months to fill up one bit. And uh, for analysis, we have taken samples that are already 18 months old. Is it okay? Lady here in the green sweater. Hi, I'm Elizabeth <coughs> Conrich. I work with the Sustainable Sanitation Alliance. I have a question for Alison. And um, you might already guess what, what I'm going to ask. That blue liquid, we've talked about it on the a discussion forum at great length, and people have said, what is that liquid? Why do you need it? Is it environmentally sustainable to have some chemical in the toilet? And the answer was generally, oh, no, that's a secret we can't really tell you. <laughs> so my question is now I have the opportunity to ask you directly. Um, when you have that process that you're going to put in, that blue liquid could give you real headaches, I think. I mean, it is, a, it is something that's supposed to kill pathogens. So your bacteria in the process will probably also suffer. So I'm curious, what's the theory behind that, you know, are you expecting lower performance because of that blue liquid? And what about advising the clean team to you know, drop that blue liquid? Is it really necessary? So I'm really curious about that. Um, yeah, um, thanks, Elizabeth. It's um, certainly probably the, the thing that I'm most worried about with this project as we move forward into actually commissioning the technologies and starting the trials is what the impact of that blue liquid is. We've done two sets of tests. Uh, different students have done two sets of tests on the blue liquid, one of which proved that it didn't really have any biocidal properties and one of which proved that it did. So we'll um, see, see what the impact, uh, the impact is. Um, I think from, so we're just going to have to see where that happens and um, if we can manage to make the technology work despite that, uh, despite that blue liquid. I think for clean team, um, they, we've also tried with them a dry toilet uh, where they use sawdust and they, the customers didn't like that as much as the blue liquid. Um, I'm really interested to hear from the, um, the team working in Haiti who are doing a similar uh, project I just heard about yesterday with, um, I think it was peanut waste. Um, and they clearly are having more success but I think the clean team customers have got used to the blue liquid and they quite like it and anything else is a poor alternative. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a challenge, and if the technologies we don't have work, we'll just have to put our thinking caps back on and, and find something else. Or we, the criteria for this, for this, um, this phase was to test off the shelf technologies. Um, I think by the time we finish this phase, there may be, well be more off the shelf technologies, so we may well have uh, more options available to us. Any other questions or comments on this session? Hi, I'm Kimberly, also from the ABD. Uh, my question is to Oswald. So you were actually talking about uh, cow dung versus uh, the quality of human fecal matter. And there was something about uh, you know, some toxicology that you were mentioning. I didn't quite follow that. When you were talking in your slide about you know, the farmers are having to handle the cow dung, but they're not so, you know, they won't touch the fecal waste. And then you know, there was some, something you were trying to say which I didn't quite understand. About the slide of this? Uh, there was a slide when you were talking about <coughs> how the farmers were all right with the cow dung, the cow, cow, the waste, but then you said there's something about human waste which is uh, toxic, or there was some toxicology analysis you were trying to do. <laughs> I was trying to compare in, uh, in Uganda where we have a lot of cows. Cow dung, the smell of cow dung is unbearable, actually, it's more than the human feces, and people are so happy at handling the smell of cow dung, but they're trying to show the emotions they have when it comes to human waste. I know all of us have pathogens in our bodies. We produce waste with some level of pathogens, but it wouldn't, those pathogens, if it would remain there without being more polythemes, other chemicals that we add in the feces, it would be easier for us to manage. 
We don't have to be looking at passages, not like heavy metals. Where do they come from? They come from when we get the, the, the way we handle that human pieces after coming from the body. Because we mishandle it, because of our perceptions about it. But they come down where people know it's from animals, not from, from their own bodies. It's, they don't want to waste it. And they are able to use it the way it is, even when it has pathogens. Like worms. Thank you. question is for my friend from England. Uh, I was looking at the results that you, you know, at the end, the, your conclusions and uh, the defendant meet the standards of I think, 100 years in this world of Uganda. Uh, you have, you know, uh, thought about the reasons behind it, or is it simply the, the, the influence and BOD so high that it cannot be treated, but it's to do something with the, 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 you know, the, the design of the sizing of the different units. It could be a nine cubits so compact that uh, maybe if, if you had just to increase the size of your idea, uh, maybe you could actually you know, achieve that 100 uh, BOD uh, uh Thank you for your question. Actually, the plant, we are operating it at higher gun protein rate compared to what we normally get in the Africa sludge. Um, this project is ongoing and we are supposed to provide a solution to the best way we can manage FICO sludge and every day we are making modifications. So at the moment, if we again test this month and we are maybe we haven't made any improvement, we are able we can maybe edit the loading rate. For example, initially we stored it with about 800 liters. It was so bad, then we reduced and now it's improving. So at the end we may, we may get an accurate loading rate of our systems so that we can meet, meet the discharge standards. If not, then we employ other techniques, maybe the tertiary treatment techniques instead of a constructed weight plant. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, actually I'm going to ask three uh, of you. Uh, the first question is going to be for um, Alison. Uh, so for the uh, system uh, bio both are uh, is kind of Arabic gravel filter. Mm -hmm. So like is this uh, it, it, do you encounter the smell because this is uh, like the uh, the, the shot and usually there's a lot of smell and then you use the Arabic uh, like a kind of technology. So uh, do you have any problem with this odor at all? Um, so we haven't finished commissioning the technology yet, so um, I don't know. I mean, Sistema Bar also have tried the system in Mexico, um, and I wasn't aware that they had any any complaints on that. It will um, also for the ultimate application. It will depend where it is at the moment. It's sat next to some solid waste uh, waste stabilisation ponds, so the smell is not going to be a problem. Where clean team move to in the future, if they're it's going to be kind of more integrated. You know, they're really out of the city at the moment. If their future treatment work is going to be done quite close to their customers, then the smell is certainly going to be something we're going to need to consider. Yeah, yeah. Just keep in mind because yeah, it's um, mostly they do an Arabic technology and like that. So just keep in mind. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. So um, my quite second question to our expert. Um, Yes, again, for the slat um, uh, treatment, mostly I know that they use a lot of anaerobic digester. Uh, and uh, for your uh, DFAS uh, uh, process, you use uh, ABR and then followed by anaerobic filter and, and followed by an anaerobic planted graph filter. So, how do you ever compare if you add a lot of uh, treatment units? And of course, it will be better quality. Uh, but then, have you ever compared if with the the, the research that or, or the latest all the use screening sedimentation and then an aerobic digester? Have you ever compared? Yes, we've done that conversion, and we find the, the highest removal efficiency is recorded in the ABR system. And even actually, we expect that's what the literature says. And we normally get about fifty percent reductions compared to other units. The ABRs. 
So in case we are going to improve, maybe we concentrate more on improving the APR system, maybe other modules than the other systems, since we are getting the highest more efficiency there. It seems so, yeah. So if there's any, in your presentation, we'll have kind of economic analysis, like compare how much dollars for per uh, cubic meter of um, treatment that you use the be fast compared with the traditional or more conventional one. I think so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, uh, the last question for yes for Dave Wilson. Sorry if I ask many questions. Um, uh, in Vietnam, I think they um, already um, uh, treat the fecal sludge and they uh, has had problem with selling fertilizer. 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 There is no market for like very little market. So, for example, for your um, experience, because you did some research and pilot in I think in Africa, is it is it so? Uh, do you have, do you have any prob problem? with selling the fertilizer. A any advice? Uh, if, like, because you know why, like, now I'm sorry, the like, chemical fertilizer made in China is much cheaper than organic fertilizer. So we cannot convince Vietnamese farmers to use the organic so far, we, we lost, we failed. So do you have any <laughs> advice? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a case of, of trial. Once they've tried it, and they see the results they get, it's, it's, it's something that we've given to the agriculturists and they, they haven't been able to tell us why it works so well. They, some guys say it's the organics that are in the material, some guys say something else, some guys say it's, a, it, it's, it's bound, the, the NP and K is bound in slow release, you don't get washed out like you get fertilizers. But what I have found, and we are currently running trials with the University of Quasimund and Tell, agricultural trials where they're trying uh, struvite and pellets and so on and so forth and, they, and, and those results will be made known sometime shortly. Um, but just on our own little homegrown trials, I'm going to say that it's quite noticeable that the yield increases on the plant. So if you're planting eggplant and you're under normal circumstances you can have up to five eggplant on the plant, you're getting up to eight or nine where you've got pellets. For some reason, I don't know why. I'm a civil guy, I'm not an agriculturist, but but that's what happens. And we've given it to some of the market gardeners, not people that are using it for their own goods, but for their own own vegetables. So we give it to the market gardeners who sell on, and they're crying. But they they keep finding say, when can we get more? When can we get more? We say, not yet. It's not licensed yet. But so, so it's just a case of when they try it and find out how well it works. I think you know it's going to explode. Yeah. You give it for free for like a couple of crops, right? 100% yeah. What we gave, what, what they used, we gave away. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, on the front row. Mark from the Amazonian. Yeah, I have a question for Osbert. Thanks for your presentation. I find uh, this, or I, I find uh, these centralized speakers are very interesting, also in the, the urban setting, even if it's just. I don't know, dewatering or some separation and an ABR and then discharging maybe the liquid into the sewer. I don't know how it can look like. What's the, in terms of legal regulations in, in the period in our urban setting in, in Uganda, who do you need to talk to in terms of discharging that from the effluent into a water body or into a drain or how does it look like? Uh, for this pilot project, we contacted the city authority. As I've said, they are part of our partners in this research. But if you're going to scale it up, the best person is to talk to the National, uh, National Environmental Management Authority in Uganda. Yeah. We need time for one last question if anyone has one. Otherwise, I think we need to wrap it up. very much to our speakers. For me, I, I love this topic um, from a chemical engineering point of view because the feedstock is so difficult and so variable and so unpredictable. It just makes it very interesting but also very challenging. Um, I think we touched on it a bit but the, the issue of decentralization of these treatment plants and the, the impact that that has on the whole business model for the entire chain is very important. So 
so in terms of both transporting the sludge to the plant and then transporting the product away. Um, uh, sort of one of the things that might be part of Alison's um, field, as she looks at me in terror, is uh, the time that the sludge spends in the pits or in the toilets, and again, the impact that that has on the treatment process and the economics of the whole thing. So there's an awful lot of factors that fit in together, um, and definitely something that we need to keep working on. So thank you again to all our speakers for their brilliant presentations, and thanks to the audience.